So just to give you a little bit of background about me, I was, and I'm, I'm, some of you know this just because I have mentioned it before in the past, but I was born and raised in Russellville, Arkansas, and from the earliest memories that I have, I was raised in a United Pentecostal Church, an apostolic church. Um, so I have the experience of being around uh, a church for most, if not all, of my life, and I really just was uh, involved to a degree. I went through the you know Sunday school, went through that whole thing, and I went through class that that kids have that they're doing right now over there. I went through the class portion, and then I went to the youth group, and I was a part of the youth group, and. And throughout my course and time of being in the youth group, I felt like getting more and more involved. And then um, I, I wanted to help out because I felt like it was my youth group. I want to be a part of it. And then as we continued, as I grew up, um, the Lord at a youth congress called me into ministry and really directed, started directing my path. And I didn't feel like, just this is kind of just for a point, I didn't feel like I was necessarily called to preach at first. That wasn't the initial call. It was just a call, a feeling inside of me that I had to help. I wanted to go do something. I wanted, because it was my church, it was something I was a part of, and I wanted to uh, be a part of it in a greater way, however I could. So the first job that I ever did at a church was, uh, I was the door greeter. I was one of the greeters out front, and um, I remember distinctly, and I may have told this story here before, but I remember distinctly welcoming people as they came in, and they put me by one particular door, and that was uh, that was supposed to be my door uh, that I that I did. So one day I was I was out there, and this was I don't know I was 15, 16 years old, something like that. Somebody comes in, and I shake their hand. It was a guest I'd never seen before, and it was a guest. I shake their hand, and when I got done shaking their hand, and I pulled my hand away, something from them stayed on me, like a piece of trash or something. It was wet. It was brown. I still to this day don't know what it is, but it was stuck on my hand. And so that introduced me to hand sanitizer. So I carried one of those in my pocket from then on. So I, I helped and, and did different things. But I, uh, when I was in high school, something, uh, something interesting happened to me that kind of opened my eyes because my perspective was that I was always connected and involved in a church in, in certain capacities. And because I was involved in the church, when my pastor would ask for us to do certain things or to not do certain things, because of my involvement in the church, I just did those things. I was just a part of it. It was part of who I was. But there was a time I was in a class in high school, and I distinctly, you know how you have those memories that just stick out in your mind from way back? You can't remember anything you learned in that class at all, but you can remember one moment. Uh, that's me. So I had this memory where I was talking to somebody, and they said, hey, are you going to go do this with us? And I said, well, no, I'm, I don't plan to do that. I don't have any intention of going. And, and they asked me the question, why not? Why are you not going? And, and honestly, without giving it much thought or consideration about a, a giving even a good answer, my, this was my answer that I gave them. Well, my pastor doesn't want us to do that, so we don't, we don't do it. That was just my initial response. And so then, you know how some people can be. When I said that, this is the answer that I got back. Well, if they ask you to jump off a bridge, would you do it? And stupid, stupid questions require a stupid response. So I said, yeah, probably. And, and it did not make sense to me in that moment, and it was because of my background, it did not make sense to me in that moment, even for a long time, like, well, I don't understand why they don't get it. I mean, I'm here in a church and helping, you know, I'm, I'm involved, and then they, I have somebody that's helping lead and guide my life, and you know, like, I, I, I don't get why they would think that I'm foolish or why they don't get it. So a couple of years passed, and I was sitting in a service or a class, just like you're sitting in now, and a man read a scripture, a verse of scripture, and it all made sense to me. Turn, look in your Bible real quick with me to Genesis 46. 
Genesis 46. So Joseph is helping his family settle in the land of Goshen. And as his family and his brothers are getting settled in, he tells them in Genesis 46, at the end, towards the end of it, he tells them, look, when you come, Pharaoh's going to ask, what's your occupation? What do you do for a living? He's going to ask you that question. And this is something I want you to understand, to say in that moment. Genesis 46, the very last verse of that chapter. Genesis 46, 34. That ye shall say, now this is what you tell Pharaoh when he asks you what your job is. This is what you say. Thy servant's trade hath been about cattle from our youth until even now, both we also our fathers, that ye may dwell in the land of Goshen. Now watch this. For every shepherd is an abomination unto the Egyptians. Then it made sense. Because, and I'm, I'm not categorizing or labeling, but this, it made sense in that moment. Because in the world, to submit your life to a shepherd, to get a shepherd, somebody that leads people, does not make sense to them. And it, it won't. The idea of submission to another person or yielding yourself is a sign of weakness, giving up, surrendering. And it does not make sense in the world. But in the church, a shepherd is needed. In the world, it's an abomination and it makes no sense. And in that moment, that memory all clicked together. I have yielded myself to a shepherd. And the world will never understand that. But I'm okay with that because I don't live for the world. I live for the kingdom, for the scripture, and I yield my life to a shepherd. Because I need somebody that can help guide me. Amen? I need somebody that can help me because I'm just like you. I have hard questions to figure out in life also. I have difficult things that I have to navigate to, and I need a shepherd. I need the good shepherd, and I need a shepherd here on earth as well. I need that. It helps guide, direct, order my life. I, I, and I'll tell you another reason why I need a shepherd. I need an example to follow. I need somebody I can pattern my life after. I do, this is, here's why, let me, this is something I believe that Scripture teaches, and we could go further into this, but this is something that I believe Scripture teaches. I want to be, I want to do my best to be like Jesus Christ. But I understand, though, that within my nature, that is probably not going to be an accomplishment because I'm flesh, and I'm weak, and I'm prone to do things that do not line up with him. So that is why, listen, that is why Paul said, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Because he's saying, look, I can be your earthly example of how to follow after God while I follow after God. So that, within itself, what Paul says there, and he says that multiple times in the New Testament, that gives us an example of somebody to follow. We imitate him as he imitates Christ. That role, that mediator, that person, we need that shepherd in our life. Amen? Turn to somebody beside you and say, we need a shepherd. We need a shepherd. Psalm 23, as Brother Odell talked about last week, is a psalm that's kind of broken down in two ways. And, and he, he briefly mentioned it last week about talking to the shepherd and from the shepherd and and how the verbiage and the language of it with the small words and the one-syllable words. And, and he introduced this uh, topic. And it's on a book that he wrote. And I forgot to bring my copy of the book here today. But uh, he, wrote, he wrote a book called Sheep Talk. And, and so it, it deals with Psalm 23 and walks through that. And the relationship of sheep and the shepherd. And, and how that, those parallels, what they teach us and what they show us. So let's read Psalm 23 together. Turn with me in your Bible there. And we're only going to cover verses 2 and 3, but we'll read 1, 2, and 3 this morning. But turn with me to Psalm 23. And this is what it says, the Lord is my shepherd. And I'm sure a lot of us can quote this. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. 
He leadeth me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. He, let's look at the first part of that, verse number two. He maketh me to lie down. So, a sheep, we do a lot of talk about sheep and the different different aspects of sheep. Now realize at the onset of this, he said it last week, I'll say it this week many times, we are not sheep. Amen? Thank God. We are like sheep. It's important to understand we have tendencies about us that reflect the nature of a sheep. We're not sheep. So last... (laughs) I thought it was pretty funny last week. He mentioned sheep are the dumbest animals in in the world. That is not a great way to introduce a class. But it's a great point to the illustration that we are like sheep. We have tendencies and things about us that make us like sheep. So uh, sheep are completely ignorant to their own limitations. So when a sheep gets scared... It will run until one of two things happen. It will run until it's either stopped or it drops. Either one. So when a sheep gets scared, one of those two things will happen. How many of you have ever seen, uh, and this is not a sheep, but it just came to my mind, a fainting goat? Have you ever seen one of those? Those are so funny. You should YouTube that. It's, it's pretty funny. Not right now, but later. Everybody has their phone out watching. So sheep, they're totally ignorant to their limitations. So they'll just keep going, or, or when they get scared, they'll, they'll run, or they'll, they'll, cause they'll, get pa- they'll pass out because they're so, uh, they, they extenuate themselves so much. It's just they run themselves into the ground. But listen, sheep won't lie down unless w- with all of these four things are met. Okay? They won't rest and lie down until these four things are met. One, until they are free from fear. That's number one. They won't rest and lie down until they're free from fear. Because a sheep needs security. It needs love. Right? How about you? Don't in your life, you want to be free from fear? What is the one thing that drives out all fear? Perfect love. Perfect love casts out all fear. So what the sheep needs is a good shepherd to provide the security and feeling of being loved. You want to come to a church that you feel loved. You want to follow a God that makes you feel loved. You don't want to follow a slave master or follow somebody that pushes you to the limits or just or, or is wreaking havoc on your life or you feel hate or, or, or bitterness or whatever from. You want to follow somebody that makes you feel loved and appreciated and like your needs are met. Amen? If every time from this pulpit or any pulpit that's spoken to them, if it comes across as negative, hateful, or condescending, is that going to help you? Is that going to make you feel like you want to stay there? That's why it's the job of a good shepherd to make sure the sheep feel the love they need. Because all of us need that. So number one, the sheep won't lie down. They won't rest until they're free from fear. Number two, the sheep, now this is a good one, okay? This is a good one to jot down in your notes. The sheep need to feel free from friction of the same kind. So let me, let me give that in, in plain terms. Sheep need unity. Sheep need the feeling of being protected and covered by each other. Because if you came to a church that you couldn't trust the person sitting next to you, you probably wouldn't keep coming to that church. Right? You need the feeling of unity, of being in a herd, of being in a group or a body. I was looking up some details about sheep and when predators come and, and after Fleeing a predator, I learned that sheep will reform into a group and look at the predator. And they use a natural herding instinct to band together for safety. Because a sheep by itself is vulnerable to attack. But a sheep that's in a group feels safe and protected because you have everybody surrounding you. 
You have people helping you. Psalm 133 and 1. Behold, how good and how pleasant is it for brethren to dwell together in unity. At the end of the day, we're all just sheep or like sheep. And we need each other. We have to have a body of people together that keep us safe. And that's why it's so scary when somebody decides to go off on their own and do their own thing and feel like, well, I don't really want to line up with all this and I would rather be by myself and I would rather... God didn't make us that way. You know, when you read uh, Genesis and you go through Genesis 1, it gives you all the things that were listed that say, and this was good. So when he created the sun and the moon and the stars, he said, this was good. And then when he goes down and he, he creates every, all the vegetation and the animals and all that, at the end of it, at the end of all those verses, it says, and God saw that it was good. Well, then when you turn your Bible one more page over and you go to the next chapter, and it says that when God made Adam and Adam was alone, you know what it says there? And God saw that it was not good. Because it's not good for man to be alone. It's not good for a person to isolate themselves. They need a body. They need, and we'll talk about this in a little bit, but they need a body of believers. They need people. We, we're sheep. We're like sheep. We need people. Number three, so they have to be free from fear. They have to be free from the friction of, of anything with their own kind. And number, number three, they have to be free from pests. How many of you uh, have ever had flies get in your house? Anybody? It's awful. We had, uh, we, we had that last year, so we gave all, we, everybody in the family had a, uh, we gave them all one of those fly swatters. Yeah. And so we just all went on a mission, who can kill the most? And it, it just became a game. You, you want to eradicate those pests, those things, those pestilence from out of your house. A sheep can get easily agitated. Now, don't look at anybody right now. But they need an environment that is free from distractions and irritating pests. When I, when I read that, I thought, just like this, Hebrews 12, and wherefore seeing we're so compassed by a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin that so be easily besets us. We have to free ourselves from some things that agitate and irritate and hinder our walk with God and our walk with the shepherd in order to properly live and be free from it, in order to lie down and rest. We need that in us. Amen? We have to get free of something. Number four, sheep feel that they can finally lay down when they're free from hunger. Sheep lie down when they have eaten their fill. You need to come attend a church, and I, I'm thankful for New Life Church, that feeds you. That, that on a Sunday morning, whether it's a 9.30 class, a 10.30 worship service with, with pastor or somebody preaching, that they feed your soul. Because guess what? Sheep are going to go where they're fed. And, you need, and it's good to be in a place that feeds you because you, you have to eat spiritually. And that's a whole other subject, but you have to eat spiritually. He maketh me to lie down. We have to, it's possible for us, we have to learn to rest, to reside, to abide, to be in a place just like sheep need. He maketh me to lie down where though? In green pastures. It's important when you look at verse number two that you understand the hills of the Middle East are known for being rocky, barren, and brown and that's because of the lack of rain between May and October. And that, vege that limits vegetation severely. So it's the duty of the shepherd to move the flock or to facilitate a place that the sheep can be fed. Green pastures don't just happen. They don't. Green, in the Middle East, and where, where the, the setting of this verse, green pastures don't just happen. It normally takes, listen to this. It normally takes the shepherd to go to the trouble of clearing the rocks, plowing the soil, planting the seed, irrigating, watering, carefully tending to the grass so that the sheep can get what they need. Does that sound like anything to you? It sounds like to me when a shepherd goes, does the work of digging out and working and preparing a sermon or preparing something to feed the sheep. 
He has to carefully work, look through the scripture, pray, study his Bible, get sensitive to what the Lord is saying, move and negotiate, get things, do the hard stuff, dig out. He's got to prepare what's being placed. I'm thankful, and, and I don't know about everybody's experience in the room, but I'm thankful to come to a church on Sunday morning that the pastor or the minister has taken time to dig out from the word of God. Amen? I, I have experienced it myself just at different points and events or things that I've been to that a message or a word or the, the, move, the, the teaching of the scripture or the, the message, I, I won't say teaching of the scripture, the message has not been dug out in the word of God. It's been dug out through humanistic thinking, philosophy, how can I make the audience feel better about themselves? How, can how can I give them something that's cool and makes... And, and just makes them feel so excited. I don't need something that makes me feel excited. I need this. I need somebody, I need a man of God to dig through this and help me find and learn what it means. Because excitement wears off. And hype and emotion is going to fade when I have trials and things that come in my life. I need something I can stand on. I need something that's been dug out. Something that can feed me. Listen, because if all I ate every day was ice cream, one, it, that'd, be, that'd be good for about a week. And then after that, you'd feel miserable because you're not getting nourished properly. So you need what comes healthy and right dug out, the word of God, and not emotion or hype or something else. You need a shepherd that can help you understand the book. Amen? He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside where? Still waters. John 10 and 4 says this. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them. And the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. They follow him because he's leading them. Sheep follow a shepherd because they can trust him. Now this, the, this message, this lesson today is all about our relationship, one, yes, with the good shepherd, but we have to also have a relationship with, a, with a, a shepherd in front of us, a shepherd that leads us spiritually, and that's, that's a pastor, a minister, that leads us and speaks to us. We have to have somebody to follow. Because, and here's, here's something interesting. How many, raise your hand if you're a mom in the room. So, you're, if you're a mom, when you had your, when you had your, child, your first child, or even your second child, um, you learn something in that when that child would cry, you knew what that cry meant, right? For the most part, you, you figured it out. You figured out this particular sound, and this is amazing to me because I'm a dude, and all I hear is crying. I'm not picking up on anything else. I'm oblivious. I need Ashley to tell me what's happening right now. You can pick up, okay, there's a diaper that needs to be changed. Or they're hungry. Or something, they, they've, they've been hurt, so they've fallen, something's happened. They need, they need attention and care. And how do you pick that up? Because of the sound that they make. You hear your child's voice, their cry, and you're able to identify it. What's amazing is the cry of a sheep is called a bleat. B-L-E-A-T. And sheep bleats are very similar to baby's cry in that when a shepherd would hear a cry from a sheep, he would know what that sheep needs. He would recognize and acknowledge this sheep needs to be fed, this sheep is in danger, this sheep has certain needs or wants. The shepherd can pick it up. And one of the things that a shepherd can pick up on is the cry of a thirsty sheep. He can identify when a sheep is thirsty. So the shepherd, it's his responsibility and job to lead the pack and the herd to waters that they can drink from. Because sometimes you can find waters that are not good to drink from. So it's his responsibility to lead that pack or that herd to a place that's not filthy, polluted, or has something wrong that could hurt the sheep. He has to lead the sheep to water that brings life. And not something that could cause hurt or death inside of them. And, it's, and this, is, 
this is an amazing analogy. Because going back 2,500 years ago, the Lord described this condition and when, he, when he spoke in Jeremiah, a condition that still prevails today. Jeremiah 2, verse 13. You can turn there with me real quick in your Bible. Jeremiah 2 and 13, because this idea of going to waters that are good or not good, it was described over 2,000 years ago. Jeremiah 2 and 13 says this, For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed out them cisterns, broken cisterns, that can hold no water. So he's saying, Jeremiah is saying from the Lord, he's saying this, my people have done two things wrong. One, they have forsaken me. They have, they have walked away. In the ancient Near East, a fountain of living water was known as an artesian spring, and it was something special. It was a constant supply of good, fresh, living water that came to you. And in ancient Israel, water was a lot of work. But if you found a fountain that could bring you living water, you took it. You stayed there. Because it, it brought you water that brought life. That's the first evil that they had. The second one is they made for themselves cisterns. Directly, water is, can be stored in a cistern. But it, it, if water is stored in a cistern, it becomes stagnant. And it becomes polluted and cannot be drinking. So, moreover, the fact that water was stored in a cistern, not to mention it was stored in a broken cistern too. So, so hear me when I say this. People often walk away and leave, uh, leave a life-giving church and a life-empowering church because either they forsake the living water and decide to go another route or they decide to make for themselves their own things, their own ways, their own paths, and believe that that can hold water. But listen, anything that I try to make with my own hands, any doctrine that I try to create, or any lifestyle way that I try to make, it's broken. It's not going to work. I have to be connected to a living stream. I've got to find a well that won't run dry. Because if I walk away and I leave this and I, and I decide to go do my own thing with my life, I'm going to end up trying to create something that's not going to last. When I have something in front of me that is going to last and is eternal, and because of my nature, and, and I know this is straightforward, honest teaching, and, and, and I, I'm thankful for everyone's here because this feels like, you know, it feels like I'm preaching to somebody else that's not here today. I'm, I'm trying to warn because of what the scriptures say and just try to speak speak life and direction, and just a guardrail for a moment. I can't think that I can do this on my own. I can't just think that because I don't agree with some aspects or some areas, I can't just think that I can walk away and create my own thing. I need to be connected with a shepherd that's leading me to living water, something I can drink of that can sustain me and help me. I need to be taken to, lead, to drink from still Water, from water that I can be trusted to drink from. Let's not leave the fountain. Amen? Let's not try to make any substitute for what the fountain gives. I, we, I speak this to, to young people all day. Here, here's the thing. When you come into a church, and, and we have camp season coming up, and we try to, ex, we try to explain this in sessions and stuff that we teach, uh, when, when you come into a church and you experience the power of God and you felt the touch of God on your life, and whether, whether it's a calling that God leads you to or, or whatever the encounter is that you have, when the Spirit of God washes over your life and you're filled with it and you get a taste of it, everything else feels shallow and everything else feels bland. And you may enjoy it for a little bit, but there's always something in you that wants what you had before. And, and you, have to, you have to realize you're, you're, when, when you stray away or when you feel like you're straying away, don't create something or try to make a substitute. The living water is here. There is a fountain that never runs dry, and it's here. And it's available for us to drink from. He leadeth me beside still waters. Let's look at the next verse. He restoreth my soul. Verse number three, the first part. He restoreth 
my soul. How many of you have ever heard of a cast sheep? When, when a shepherd would describe a cast sheep. Anybody heard of that before? So a cast sheep is a sheep that somehow would end up on its back and its legs would be up in the air because sheep aren't nibble, nimble and agile. Um, it would end up on its back and it can't roll back over. So it is stuck on its back. So the sheep would have its legs up in the air and so what scientifically what happens to a sheep is the gases would begin to build up in the stomach and if the shepherd does not intervene in that life, in that life of the sheep, the sheep will die because as the, it, it essentially begins to suffocate, suffocate laying on its back because of the way that the, the sheep is structured and its, its physiological features, it'll, it'll, it'll die. So what the shepherd has to do is it has to take the sheep and turn it back over and then it has to begin to massage the legs in order to get the blood flow and the circulation and the oxygen back to the proper areas of the body of the, of the sheep. It has to work and help that sheep in order to get back to where it needs to be in order to live properly. Psalm 42 and 11 probably describes a lot of us at, at points. Why art thou cast down, O my soul, and why art thou disquieted within me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him, who is the health of my countenance and my God. So, as like sheep are, we sometimes go through places where we're, we're flat on our back, or spiritually, emotionally, we're just not in the position and place we should be. And so because of that, we're suffocating because of that there's, some, there's life that's going out of us. So what, what this analogy gives to rest, for the shepherd to restore the sheep, he has to come along beside the sheep, massage its legs, and get it back to its proper position. He, even if it's uncomfortable, even if it's a lot of work, even if it puts a little bit of pain in it, he has to come alongside the sheep in order to save its life. And do a little work with that sheep. I, I know a lot of us, and, and I've experienced it too. You've come into church, you're burned out, you're tired, you've dealt with things, you're wore out emotionally, and you just don't feel like you can worship, or you just feel like you've lost part of it, or you, you've, you've, you just, you're not the, where you used to be, and, and things just feel dry or draining or whatever. And it's, on, it's, it's the job and the help of the shepherd to come along and to give life back into the sheep. How many of you have ever, and be honest with this, how many of you have ever come into church on a Sunday, a Wednesday night, and it was like the preacher knew where you were living? Anybody? It's like he starts saying stuff, and you're like, who's been talking to him? He's, he's reading my Facebook, isn't he? No, I know we don't do that. He's, he knows where I'm at. He knows exactly where I'm at. Because he's, it's, it's like he has a one-way communication with God or something. Because he is shepherding the people. He's coming along, and though he may say things at points or times, or a minister may preach, and something's a little uncomfortable, he's trying to revive back up that sheep again. He's trying to get that sheep back to where it needs to be. I'm thankful, even if it's hard for me to hear, I'm thankful for the life-giving words that come across the pulpit. The things that speak into me that help me get back on my feet. That help me get back my worship. That help me get back the way that I should be reading my Bible and praying and studying for the words that are given. This is what that scripture I read a second ago. Why art thou cast down, O my soul? Which is us, many times. And why art thou disquieted within me? Hope thou in God, for yet I shall praise him who is the health of my countenance. If you stay connected to the body, the shepherd is going to help you get back on your feet. His words are going to help you get back to where you need to be. The shepherd can help us. He can help us be restored. How many of you sometimes, from time to time, need to be restored? We all do. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in paths of righteousness. A shepherd would normally lead a flock, and, and the front has many important responsibilities, but 
um, he would try to lead the flock and, and look for the best possible grazing or monitor the sheep's condition or fending off many, many predators. But the sheep, sheep are a creature of habit. And if given the choice, sheep will either stray off or want to remain in the same place. So it's so important that the shepherd, uh, like, like we are like sheep, the shepherd helps us to stay in a path that leads us to righteousness. He leads us direction and path. I was thinking about, um, I was thinking about this session as I was preparing for it, and um, this is just me being completely honest with with you this morning. Uh, and maybe Brother Oda will watch this in a little bit. This is it's intimidating uh, for me because I'm speaking this morning on another man's book. So he wrote this book and then entrusted me to stand up here and to speak on it. A book that he wrote and, and all the details and a lot of this, it's, a, it's an amazing book. And so that was a huge honor for me when he talked to me about it. And he was, and we've had several conversations leading up to this. And he is just a wealth of information. He's pouring out all of these things to me. And there's no way my tiny brain is comprehending all of this. But he's just given it to me over and over and over again. And so when I was preparing for this, I thought, this man is trusting me to teach from his book, from a book that he wrote. And I thought, that is what God does with a shepherd every single week. He trusts us to communicate something the author wrote every single week. So the shepherd, the good shepherd, is trusting a shepherd to teach and lead the congregation from this book every single week. To lead us in paths of righteousness. To lead us to the places that we all need to go. And he's trusting a man of God to lead the shepherd. And I, and I don't know about you, and I'm not, I'm not the senior pastor here, but I'm glad I have somebody that's following and leading me to righteousness. Somebody I can follow that's leading me to a place I need to go to. Amen? I'm thankful that the direction that we're going, because direction matters. Direction matters. I'm thankful that the direction that God is leading us, is, uh, that this, the man of God is leading us, is toward a path of righteousness. He leadeth me in paths of righteousness. One last thing I want to talk to you about tonight, or this morning before we dismiss, is the sheepfold. It's important when we read through Psalm 23 to know about the sheepfold and I mentioned the body earlier and this kind of will bring us home here we're led in paths of righteousness for his name's sake that's the remaining part of the scripture it's important for us to know what a sheepfold looks like Lane if you don't mind to put that picture up on the screen this is a picture of a sheepfold what it looks like so John 10 7 through 9 and I'll just read this then Jesus said in them again Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. And all that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and, go in and out and find pasture. So a sheepfold, this is similar to what you would see in the Middle East. A sheepfold looks like a pen or a cage uh, built of rock or different materials that they could find to build it, and the sheep would be housed inside of this. And there's several reasons for building it this way. One of the reasons is to protect it from predators, because obviously the predator can't get over the wall. The, whatever animals would try to attack, they can't get over the wall to get to the sheep. So in order for him to keep the sheep congregated to an area for whatever the purpose was, he would lock them or move them into a pen in order for them to stay there. And they would remain in that until they were ready to move or they needed to go find somewhere else or, or greener pastures or whatever it was until the shepherd's leading. But what's interesting about this picture is look at the door. So the shepherd is in the door. So at night, the shepherd would lie and sleep in the doorway of the sheepfold. It was his job to protect the sheep and to keep them from any harm. But listen, this is the important part about this. 
in order for a sheep to leave, he would have to climb over the body of the shepherd. In order for any sheep to walk out, to leave, to abandon the flock and walk away, he would have to leave and walk over the body of the shepherd. He would have to walk over the body. If God is the good shepherd, then for a sheep to leave, he's got to walk over the body of Christ. I had a conversation a few, a few months ago with another young minister, and in this, um, he said a great statement. And, and I wholeheartedly agree with this, and this is kind of how I, I wanted to close this class based on the topic and the discussion. Uh, he said that when, when a person decides to walk away, when, when an individual decides that they are no longer going to believe this truth, preach this truth, stay in it, and they're going to go another direction, they've got to walk over three different types of people, okay? And, and I, this is very straightforward, but they've got to walk over three different types of people. They've got to walk over the elders and say that what you believed and what you held on to and what you value in your life I'm just going to walk away and abandon it. They've got to walk over their peers, the people that are right now in the trenches beside them, and they've got to walk over the next generation and reject all three of them and say, I, I'm moving past all, all three of those guardrails, that body of Christ, I'm walking over those in order to get out. And so a sheep to leave would have to walk over the body of the shepherd. Can I tell you, we, we need every sheep member, and we need as the body of Christ to be careful and mindful of each other and to help each other. Because I don't, I, I'm not, I didn't say that for any guilt or to point fingers at anybody, but to say that there has to be, a, there has to be unity in the church and unity together that holds the sheepfold together that won't let somebody walk out and walk over something. Amen? We need each other. We need to follow after the, the good shepherd and the shepherd that leads us and keep the body together. Stand with me if you don't mind. Here's what I'd like us to do as we close this class. Would you link up to somebody beside you? And we're just going to take a moment to pray. And pray for each other. That as we are like sheep, or we have tendencies like sheep, that we would stay connected to the body. So would you link up and would you pray for somebody else this morning? Pray for them and their mind and their heart that they would be connected to the good shepherd. Lord, right now, as your word has gone forth this morning, as God, the instruction and the help that's come from your word, I pray that it would land on good soil today. And I ask you, Lord, that you would guide and direct the hearts and lives of every person here, that we would accomplish your will in the body. Lord, help us not to go find another fountain to drink from, not to drift somewhere else, to understand and value what's brought to us every single week from this pulpit. Thank you, God, as, as we give you glory and honor and praise that you restore us through a man of God and restore us through the word of God, store us by your spirit. We thank you, Lord, for how you're helping and working. Give us, God, I pray, wisdom and discernment of what to do and when to do it, Lord, to act on your word to follow what you're teaching and leading us. Thank you, Jesus, for the help of, of your spirit. In Jesus' name.